Um, and uh, so welcome everybody to the Cleveland Big Data Meetup, January 24th, 2022, virtual style. Uh, again, we wanted to at least do this hybrid. Uh, uh, the uh, Omicron had other ideas, uh, so we're doing it virtual again. Um, and uh, yeah, so on with the show. Uh, we've got a great lineup. So we've got a, a talk from NASA Glenn, uh, machine learning models to predict cognitive impairment of rodents subjected to space radiation. Um, we've got a great talk from KeyBank on a cloud case study with Google BigQuery, and then also another great talk from Elastic, um, observability at scale with Elastic. And uh, yeah, all three of them I'm super excited for. Um, so uh, yeah, this is, uh, is going to be a great one. Um, so quick announcements again. Um, I'm reminding people of the member approval process. I did that because of drive-by spam. Um, so we're always, Cleveland Big Data is always looking for uh, for new members. So if you see or know anybody that had clicked the approval process or clicked the um, uh, submit for membership and, um, and I didn't get back to them immediately, uh, again, my apologies. I have to do that because, again, like I said, I had a drive-by spam issue and I try to get to everybody within at least 24 hours, but um, if there's a delay, that's what's going on. I'm a friend of the show. Uh, so a tradition in Cleveland Big Data is if you do a, uh, a talk for Cleveland Big Data, you become a friend of the show. And this is, uh, it's like a life peerage in England. Um, you're a friend of the show for life. You can put that on your resume. Uh, you cannot gift it to your children or to your uh, spouse, um, but it is yours for, for life. So uh, you are a friend of the show always, and you're always welcome back for another talk. Um, Mike is a friend of the show. Mike, you've been, you've done at least one before, right? Oh, Mike, you're, you're muted. Yes, I am a friend of the show. Awesome. Lucas, this is the first time for you, right? No, I'm a friend of the show. I did a, oh, uh, man, how embarrassing Hadoop. for me. No, that's all right. That Hadoop, like, uh, automation, automating Hadoop cluster builds talk. A couple that's right. Ago. That's right. Uh, Mona is definitely going to be, uh, this is the first time for her, so she's going to become a friend of the show. So it's uh, good stuff. And then we're, uh, likewise, we're going to have a, um, so so if you know, oh, so if you know anybody that wants to be a friend of the show, please let me know. We're always looking for new speakers and new ideas. Um, so please hit me up. And uh, and again, the uh, there's going to be a March 22 meetup. Um, we've got the lineup set for that. That one's minimally is going to be, uh, you know, Zoom. Um, we'll We'll see. Uh, what the CDC says about a, a hybrid meetup, but minimally it'll be Zoom. Um, some quick announcements. So I, I published this last year, last year, what am I talking about? It feels like last year, last week, uh, on the Association for uh, Computing Machinery, Log4j and the Thankless High Risk Task for Managing uh, uh, Software Component Upgrades. Um, for the folks that have read it, they said it was kind of therapeutic <laughs> for a lot of the things that they've been dealing with um with uh, the log4j exposure so if you haven't seen it uh, check it out and let me know what you think um so now time for recruiting shout outs um progressive's got several um so check out uh, so they're looking for a devops engineer and dba positions and one data engineer i just got a, this has happened like five minutes before the meetup um uh, chris kane uh from confluent said that they were also looking for a kafka engineer for progressive so check out that link um the university hospitals is looking for several um positions for data scientists and informatics so contract uh, contact steve tater he's a a recruiter um but those are for university hospitals i'm told and health informatics um oclc says they're still looking for um a data platform architects so check out that link oclc down in columbus and so for those uh that don't know um oclc is the organization that maintains the dewey decimal system so if you work for OCLC, you will control all the knowledge. Um, so, so that's an additional benefit, or at least how it's categorized. And also 1848 Ventures, um, I understand they're looking for, still looking for a data scientist. So again, thanks as always. I'm Chris Barrett. Chris is actually retiring um, from Progressive, so uh, he'll probably be stepping down. So I want to give him a round of applause for everything he's done for years um, for Cleveland Big Data. And as always, also thank you for the Linux Foundation. Um, we literally could not do this without you because we're using your Zoom. So thank you so much um, for uh, for the support for Cleveland Big Data and uh, and uh, John Murdoch and the Linux Foundation. So thank you. Um, 
So, and always thank you for the Cleveland Beginner members. Uh, again, you, you are make, what make this possible. Um, so with that said, on with the show, uh, the first um, uh, the first speaker is gonna be Mona from, uh, from NASA. I'm gonna stop sharing. Hang on, looks like we have, oh, that was a, a comment. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing. And again, it's the speaker's preference on how to address questions. So uh, Mona, you said you wanted questions at the end. Is that right? Yes. Yes. So gotcha. hi, everyone. I'll try to make it less than 20 minutes and keep uh, some time for questions. You can hear me, right? And uh, go for it. See my screen. Okay. So uh, thanks first uh, for inviting me, Doug. So this was uh, a great opportunity and I'm very happy that I'm going to become a friend of the show. I didn't know about that. I know I can't give my friendship to someone else, but I think friends of friends have to have some perks. Anyway, we'll talk about this. Um, so uh, also the first thing I wanna talk about is that although this is big data meetup, but I have a very, very small data. So that is, um, that is a challenge for us, but I will talk about it. So my name is Mona Matar. I work for the cross-cutting computational modeling project team at Glenn Research Center. Uh, we do a lot of modeling for astronauts for, uh, to support the human research program. So we uh, do some modeling for uh, the renal stones that could uh, uh, get in astronauts or um, like uh, the food delivery system. We do some uh, uh, analysis and then modeling for the space inside the graph to put the medical uh, equipments and you know uh, this work is was part of uh, seeing how does the radiation and the space environment affect the brain. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, we're not allowed to rad irradiate humans uh, with really heavy ions to to test them. So we do that on rodents. So that's why I will have my work today uh, on rodents. So I'm gonna start with some experimental background to tell you where do we get our data from. Our data is from uh, rats. The type is Wistar. They are 10 months old. The test that is done over those rats is the attentional set shifting test to check the cognitive flexibility performance. So that relates to the astronauts' uh, capability to do some tasks when they are uh, traveling through space. Uh, the test itself is a seven stage, and I think I can use my pointer. It's a seven uh, consti constituted of seven stages. Uh, this is the name of the stages. Each one of the stages, there is a different relevant and irrelevant cues in what each of these two bowls. So there's a certain odor, there's a certain digging media in each one of these two bowls, but one of the stages, one of the cues is relevant, the other one is not. And in each stage, depending on the, how they're changing the cues, the rat has to go and learn uh, the cue that tells it where is the food reward placed in which one of those. So every time this door is open and the rat is uh, uh, leaving to check and get the food reward, that's an attempt. And the criteria to pass each one of these stages is to go six consecutive attempts. Uh, and they are allowed 30 attempts only. If they don't uh, make it, they are allowed one more day, another 30 attempts. The experiment was conducted by Dr. Richard Britton at East Virginia Medical School. So um, particularly Dr. Britton pre-screens his rats. So from those ad sets uh, tests, he only uses the first four stages and check the rats to make sure that they are uh, smart enough to go with the experiment. The reason is because astronauts are um, higher than average uh, in, in the way they think and in their uh, skills of reasoning. So in order to uh, repeat that in rodents, he makes sure, Dr. Britton makes sure that the rats are smart enough. So we, after, these rats are pre-screened. They are either in the control group or they are irradiated by one of the ions, helium, silicon, or iron. 
and the dose is 1, 5 or 10 centigrade. Now, these ions and the dose uh, are basically what is expected to be seen when someone goes to Mars and comes back. So for a three-year mission, an astronaut is not expected to get more than 15 centigrade of each one of these ions. There's also other ions, but for this presentation and for the data we have, we're showing these three ions at these three doses. So after the rats are irradiated, uh, after 12 weeks after that, Dr. Britton again tests them for the seven stages of the ATSET. Each time the rat is uh, pre-screened or post-screened with one of the stages, the number of attempts to reach the criteria is recorded. So now when we're going to do machine learning, it's all about the attempts to reach criteria. This is going to be our, um, our prediction. We, we, tend, we want to be able to predict the cognitive impairment of a rat if they got the radiation, but we need it at a subject base level and we want it based on the pre-screen scores. So what we are doing is we are using these scores and the irradiation to try to know, are they gonna be irradiated in these stages? The reason we do that is because for astronauts, we wanna test the probability that they could fail a task when they are in space travel. And we wanna know that before they even go in space. Um, of course, for safety reasons, and to be able to pick the, uh, the astronauts that are the most capable of completing the mission. So we can do basic statistics with the attempts to reach criteria for each one of the stages. For example, if we are looking, this is the, uh, all of the seven stages post the radiation. This is for the silicon ion. We can look at the attempts to reach criteria for zero, one, five, and 10 centigrade uh, for each one of these stages. And look at the average, which is what people start with. Let's look at the average and standard error of the mean. And um, the star means they are statistically different from the control group in that stage. So we can do this analysis. And of the 15, for example, this is the number of rats for one centigrade. Um, 62 would be the number of rats for zero centigrade, which is the control group. And then this is the standard error of the mean. The problem is that we have a large error of the mean. So if you think about it, if you wanna look at a standard deviation, for example, uh, assume this is uh, get we, we get it from the standard error of the mean. So it's this number multiplied by square root of the number of animals. So basically it's gonna go maybe from here to here. So that's a big marge of error. So this information is not really implicative to how each individual is within that uh, those groups. And uh, we, we, I just want you to notice that there's a big num a difference in the number of animals for each dose. Um, and that's something that you're gonna, you see a lot with uh, any behavior studies. Uh, you can also look at the uh, distribution by looking at the box plots, and you can see that there's a lot of variations. There's a lot of outliers. And the reason because uh, of that is any behavior test will have a lot of differences within each group. Um, we can do, of course, this for the helium, the silicon, and the iron, looking at the uh, means and at the box plots. But this is, will just give us an information about the group, and it's not implicative of every person in the group. So that's why we're going to do a predictive modeling using machine learning. So in order to do that, and because of the lot of the variations, we're not going to predict directly the scores after irradiation, but we are going to uh, predict impairment. So we're going to have a classification, impaired, not impaired. But before we do that, we need to define what is an impaired rat? How can we decide what is the score for impairment? In order to do that, we look at the control group and we pick a stage, for example, SD. We do some population analysis and we actually use the cumulative distribution. Then from that, we look at what is the threshold or the score that about 95% of those rats were able to get to. Because for us, uh, the control group is supposed to be like a role model or how a, um, a rodent is supposed to be behaving if they were not irradiated. 
So we look at those and we get the 95th percentile and we say this is the threshold score. Then we go back to each individual in the control group and the irradiated group and we see how much did they score and decide whether they are impaired or not impaired. So now our data is labeled. Every um, rat we have is, you can think about it as a row, and then we know whether they are impaired or not. That's the output. Now, in order to predict the impairment, of course, we use machine learning. And as I think all of you know in this group that we split our data set into two uh, sets. Um, first of all, we don't use validation because we have very small uh, uh, data. So we're using training and testing. So the testing, we take the dose. So we want to be able to predict using, using the dose and using the pre-screen scores. To do the training, we give this output label, which is the impairment for that subset. And we use a machine learning. So we use the classifiers support vector machine, Gaussian naive base, random forest, and artificial neural network. Today, I'm just going to talk about the artificial neural network. So after we train the model, whichever model we pick, uh, now that the parameters here are trained, then we take the second uh, subset of data, but we only take the dose and the pre-screen scores and test the classifier, have it predict the impairment. We do. Then we compare the impairment label that was predicted to the actual impairment label of the rat. And because we have a very small sample size, uh, we do the cross-validation using the leave one out. So basically, we for this part, we take all of the samples except one, and we only test on the leftover uh, one uh, sample. And then we repeat that until we have tested every one of the rats. So every one of the rats had the chance to be uh, a test subject. Uh, so how we do that, now we're going to look at how we use those uh, um, parts on the, on the model. So this is the control group. And this is, for example, the CD stage. We look at the percentage in, uh, of impaired rats. So we look at the cumulative distribution. Um, and to be more visually, I plot it here for you. So for an X value, which is the number of attempts, if you go hit the um, plot and you go to the left, then you see what percentage of rats were able to score this score or below. So if we're, we're trying to hit the 95 percentile, then we go a horizontal line at 95, and then we go down. Now we have a 36. So that means the score of 36 is the threshold that tells us whether a rat is impaired or not for the CD stage. Uh, now, if you want to ask uh, why do we have multiple stages, think about stages as being multiple tasks that an astronaut can do. And think about each, each stage to involve different parts of the brain. So now we know the threshold. We can go back and look at the rats and say, uh, this rat scored this much above or below. And then we can tell whether they are impaired or not. So now all of our data is labeled. Uh, before we move to the machine learning, there's uh, one piece of information we can get also from the cumulative uh, percentage plots, the cumulative distribution plots. Uh, you can look also not only at the control group, but also the 1, 5, or 10 centigrade. So this is an example for the iron. And you can see at this uh, threshold how many rats were able to score that score or below. And you can tell, and you can uh, directly see that for the iron, when we irradiate the rats with iron, as the dose increases, the percent of rats that are impaired is increasing. So that's one thing that tells us, you know, um, it, it's getting up for, for the iron. We don't know yet which one. Uh, we can repeat, of course, the same thing for not just the iron. So this is the iron, this is the silicon, this is the helium. These are the uh, percent of irradiated rats for the SD stage. So for today, I'm only looking at the SD and CD stages. So that's two of the seven stages. Uh, you can definitely see here that the silicon has a dose, uh, a dose response, and the iron has an even higher dose response, and something goes much worse for the 10 centigrade, whereas the helium, not so much. Uh, for the CD stage, we have a little bit of effect here at 10 centigrade for the helium, 
the silicon is confused. And then actually, even Dr. Britton told us that there's a rat that, um, you know, he, he saw cannibalism in rats that were exposed to silicon, but that's not in this, shouldn't be in this presentation. Um, the iron, you can see, as I showed you, the dose effect. So now we know that there is some trend some places. Can we predict those rats who are expected to be impaired before they are uh, impaired? So we're gonna use artificial neural networks. We have the input layer, which has the features, which are the dose and the pre-screen. So these are the four first scores that are uh, the scores before irradiation. Uh, the hidden layer, we use 16 nodes here and then eight nodes. Again, we have very small sample size. And then the output layer, which gives us the uh, impairment label. We use the ReLU function for the hidden layers. Um, so in the forward propagation, as you know, information moves forward uh, with a certain weight uh, multiplied by the value that's coming added and then passing through the um, uh, activation function, then moving to the next layer and so on until we go to the impairment label. Then the system checks whether it's correct or not and then uh, returns a loss function and then we repeat that until we go through the data. So let's go to the results. There is many ways, um, you know, accuracy or uh, false positives, negatives, a lot of uh, metrics. There's the F1 score. I have them in the paper. I'll, I'll put a link for the paper too. Um, the MCC, the yeah, Matthew correlation coefficient. Here I'm showing the ROC curve and the PR curve. Um, the random chance to tell us how is our classifier. So if our classifier knows nothing and is not really informed from the data, uh, we should see a diagonal line going from bottom left to the top right. And then we should see a horizontal line that is looking at um, uh, the uh, per uh, well the percent of impaired or the ratio of impaired rats with, within each one of the ions. Uh, in both plots, you can see that the iron has a better prediction. So the um, classifier was able to find those rats who were impaired after iron irradiation more than the silicon and was absolutely confused with the helium. Same thing here. And this is not uh, weird because if you look at the percentage of impaired rats, there is something to learn here from uh, the data. So it's going up and it looks like there is some relation between the dose and the pre-screen scores that's given us or pinpointing to some of those individual who were impaired for the iron and the silicon. Whereas for the helium, it's almost like the same. Uh, hey, this is for time check. You've got about uh, less than three minutes. Okay, um, almost done. So this is for another stage and also the same thing. It's showing us uh, the CD stage, how we can do better prediction for the iron. So now we are able to find those who can be impaired. So as conclusions, we can look at population analyses to find cognitive deficits at a, as a group level. But uh, if we look at the percentage of impaired rats, we can find a dose effect for the iron and the silicon uh, in certain stages. The helium only shows um, an effect at 10 centigrade. If we, when we use machine learning models like the artificial neural network, we can pinpoint to those individual that are at a higher risk of impairment. And this is based on just the dose that is expected and some pre-exposure uh, measures or scores. Uh, we are limited, however, because we need more behavior tests and we need more features about each subject that could be linked to why this is happening and why some subjects could be uh, impaired while others do not, while they have the same pre-screen scores. Um, another thing, if we are given multi-ion and multi-stressors data, we can even combine using artificial neural networks, we can combine the effect and see how it works. Uh, there's something that we cannot uh, run away from, and that's the inter and intra variabilities in any behavior test in biology. So that, that's something always there. And we need more work to be able to translate any result we can find in rodents to human subjects. Uh, for more information, you can take a picture of the uh, paper and you will find this information and more, um, and more scores 
uh, in it. And if you have any questions, I think I still have one minute maybe, or you can email yep. this. Yeah, we got about a minute left. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So that, that was fantastic. Does anybody have any questions? Please put them in the chat. Um, so with one, uh, with respect to um, the rat intelligence, um, did you give them an RAT test? Sorry, that was a terrible joke. Um, instead of an SAT test. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, um, okay. I'll I'll give I'll tell you something funny. Is that uh, we can only do the ad set on the rats because if you do it on the mice, they can't even pass the first stage. So <laughs> rats are much smarter than than uh, mice. So that gives you an idea about how difficult it's also gonna be to translate or go from rodents or rats to human. There's a big gap still there. So that that was, th thank you, Mona. That was the beeper. Everybody give <laughs> Mona a, a, big, a big round of applause, either physically or virtually, however you can. Uh, Mona, that was, that was, that was terrific. Um, and thank uh, you all. yeah, that was, that, that, that was really cool. It's amazing to see the commonality depending on, um, no matter which area, it still comes back to, do you understand your data? Can you label your data? Um, and then usually people are always saying, I want more data. <laughs> um, great stuff. Uh, next no, up, oh, go ahead. Sorry, but ne next time next time you, you wanna say, I need more data, think about those 15 rats that I have in each one of the groups, then yep. ask for more. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, ne next up is uh, Mike Anders. Yeah, hey Doug, hey, Mona, you might have to stop sharing because I can't seem to share. There you go. So, uh, hey Mona, thanks. I had a rat in high school that I tested, but I just I gave it alcohol to see how it could do when it was drunk, and I didn't do a lot of data back then. I just noticed that it couldn't find the water or the food once I made him drunk, but um, that was fun in high school. And I, uh, I also periodically test my engineers that work for me to see if, uh, if they're impaired while they're working too, uh, and see how many can actually pass that test. And Lucas never passed when he worked for Explorers. But so I'm uh, Mike Honors. I'm going to talk about KeyBank and our journey to the cloud. You know, uh, just like Buzz Lightyear to infinity and beyond. Uh, and I'll share our journey with you and where we're at going to uh, taking our data to Google. A little bit about me. Uh, here's a little. Uh, a little resume, and I'm not going to go through it, but as you can see, it doesn't matter if you're a startup or you're a large corporate publicly held company, your company can be sold or merged. And uh, I've worked for Key three times. This is my third tour. I've been back about eight years, but you can see right below Key is Explorers, and that's where I did work with Doug and Lucas, and that company was sold to IBM. And then uh, Doug just wrote a nice article about how that imploded after IBM. <laughs> bought them and they've sold off all the uh, all the assets so uh, uh, and I put the quote up there if you don't like change you're going to hate extinction uh, so uh, we're all dealing with change and um, hopefully someday we can get back together I did attend uh, this uh, picture that Doug sent me you can see a picture of me and Doug up there front uh, probably 12 years younger than we are now the first uh, big data Cleveland Hadoop uh, in the uh, conference room of Cleveland Clinic uh, Innovation Center and Doug bought a couple pizzas, and I think he had a little keg or a beer or uh, somewhere in that room that we were drinking. Uh, and it's been a long time, Doug. Congratulations on keeping uh, the thing going. Someday, I hope we can get back together. You can see there's no COVID spacing in this room, and nobody was wearing masks uh, back then. But uh, glad to be back and speaking. So if you don't know Key, we're a regional bank. Uh, we have about a thousand branches. We cover a lot of the the Northeast and the the West Coast. Not a lot right in the middle. Um, and we've been around, I don't know, 150, 180, 180 years, coming up on almost 200. And uh, we have a, at Key, this is my shout out for recruiting. We're doing a lot of cool stuff at Key, a lot of uh, new tech, whether it's uh, robotic process automation there on the left and low code. Those are some of the vendors we work with. Uh, DevSecOps technology, we were an early DevSecOps from a corporate perspective using Red Hat OpenShift, but have recently moved it over to uh, Google Anthos for containers and most of our digital platforms all run on uh, container technology now. And then recently really investing in APIs, Confluent, Kafka, Apogee. And then I'm going to speak about data and analytics and what we're doing with Google uh, Cloud and how we're uh, moving all our data and analytics to Google. 
Uh, but if you're interested in any of these, feel free to send me a link or reach me on LinkedIn and um, we'll get you plugged into the right team if you're interested. So back, uh, the promise of Hadoop in uh, Teradata, back when Doug was at Explorer, so it was an early adopter of Hadoop, right? The promise was, hey, I could use Hadoop for scale out compute, use commodity hardware, high-speed batch performance. We used it at Explorers uh, and it worked. It actually was scaled out, it worked, but it only really worked in kind of one direction. <laughs> if you wanted to index in multiple directions, it got a little harder. So most people used another platform for kind of end analytics. Uh, at Key, we used Teradata. I think at Explorers, we used Vertica and we would take a lot of the output of Hadoop, uh, stick it in a high-speed analytic proprietary hardware and that was very expensive and build our marts and reporting and analytics in Teradata. But over time, uh, so at Key, uh, we look like this. We're on premise. Uh, we have about 150 data sources at Key, you know, that run the bank and we source all that data, probably run about 4 billion records a, a night uh, from an extract and load. We shove it into Hadoop, had a data lake. It was originally at Key. Uh, when I left Explorers, I came to Key, said you guys should be looking at Hadoop. We were a big IBM customer, so we bought the, uh, we didn't even buy, we had access to the IBM distribution that Doug really loves. Uh, so we installed the IBM distribution, which then IBM gave over to Hortonworks, which then merged with Cloudera. And now Cloudera has been delisted <laughs> and, and Hadoop uh, is, I think, gonna go through a slow death. Uh, and then we moved that data into Teradata and uh, Teradata had like Marts and analytic workspaces for end users. And then we hit that with a bunch of analytic tools, including Tableau, SAS, Spark, R, Python, in a, in a legacy Cognos for those of you who know IBM products from way back. And that was our data supply chain. I'd say the front half of this was centralized and managed centrally. The back half of this was kind of federated and the end users controlled a lot of that and did their own things. But uh, this is not a stock ticker chart. This is Google Trends for Hadoop. I couldn't really pull a stock ticker for Cloudera because they're delisted and it's, I didn't have a way to find the historical charts, but uh, their stock did go up and go down. A lot of people made money when it went up and a lot of people lost money when it went down. Uh, but if you look at just Google Trends, you know, the trend for people searching for Hadoop has gone down. And as I mentioned, Cloudera delisted uh, from the stock exchange in October. And, and that's primarily due because of what Google, Snowflake, Amazon, and Microsoft are doing with high-end scale out uh, data warehouses and that you don't really need Hadoop to get the speed and performance or the cost. So from our perspective, we had Hadoop and Teradata. We said, look, we can get rid of both those platforms, uh, go to Google Cloud, uh, I think you could swap in their Snowflake, you could swap in their Amazon Redshift, you could swap in their, well, we didn't look at Microsoft too hard, but I do think they, they're getting close to a good scale out uh, data compute. So we chose Google, I'll talk a little bit about that. Google gives us that elastic scale out uh, uh, for compute, gives us commodity pricing, it actually has a pay for use model, which we like, which is you pay per query per terabyte scanned. Um, it's high performance and it supports kind of these analytic workspaces that Teradata had and it supports advanced analytics tooling. So that's the general background. That was our target uh, landing area. Um, and we went through, so uh, originally the, the data supply chain at Key was used NAS storage, and then it moved from NAS to Teradata for analytics. Uh, and then we put Hadoop in probably eight, seven, six to eight years ago. And now we're ripping Hadoop out. So we're in, uh, we're, we've actually moved Teradata out. We've moved Teradata all to Google. We've turned off Teradata this past summer. Uh, we're in the process of shifting all the data from Hadoop up to, to Google. We'll talk about some of the variances and differences between that. And our end goal is that all of our data and analytics are running up at Google. Um, and we're about, we're on that journey right now. So today the end state would look like this. So everything would be in Google. We'd move our data lake to Google. Our data marts would be in Google. Our analytic workspaces would be in Google. And our analytic tools would all be up in Google. Right now, uh, all the Martin and Analytic workspaces up there, we're in the, uh, all of our Spark clusters and Python code is running up in Google. Uh, we'll start to shift our analytic environments, Tableau and SAS up to Google. And we're right in the middle of moving the data lake. The, the challenge with the data lake, there's a lot more data in the data lake than there were in the Marts. So um, it's gonna take a little more time to shift it up there and revalidate it. Um, but uh, we are getting the performance we expected. We are getting the cost we expected. Uh, and so we do think that a single platform for all your data makes sense. And again, we took a look at it in, in 2019. So about mid-year 2019, we started looking at this. And these were all the vendors we looked at back then. Uh, you can see Snowflake in there. You can see Amazon Redshift. 
uh, Teradata was in that mix, BigQuery from Google, and then some of the, the open source databases. But we, we quickly narrowed it down to two. We looked at Snowflake and BigQuery. We stayed away from Amazon because Amazon dabbles in banking more than let's say Google and Microsoft do or Snowflake. Uh, they have a lot of banking services and so didn't want to give them any more business than they already have. Uh, but at the same time, uh, big Google was really investing uh, heavily in their cloud uh, architectures. Um, so we did we did a POC really between BigQuery and Snowflake. Uh, both of them provide you know scale out compute at commodity pricing, architected slightly different. But in 2019, Snowflake was pretty early. Like if you had invested or got early access to their stock or joined Snowflake in 2019, you would have done really well in their IPO. Um, but Google had also hired Thomas Kirian from Oracle and Google was hiring a ton of uh, corporate salespeople and, and knew how to deal with corporate customers more than Snowflake. Snowflake was pre-IPO at this time, couldn't really, uh, one of the issues we had with Snowflake was, especially for a bank like ours, was getting them to agree to a limitation of liability if there was a data breach on their platform. And being a startup, they couldn't really sign up for much, but Google with big pockets could say, yes, if we have a data breach, uh, we'll cover you. And uh, that might have swung it a little bit towards BigQuery and from our legal perspective. And Google, just like Amazon and Microsoft, have a ton of technology. So when we looked at um, Snowflake versus Google, if you pick Snowflake, and I know some people on the call have, um, our view was you'd still have to surround it with a lot of surround technology from your ETL tools to your, your uh, ML tools uh, and your Spark clusters. And so we didn't, we felt with Google, we could go kind of horizontal with the platform, not just BigQuery from a data, but also uh, surround it with high-end analytics tools and their data processing tools and, and therefore make it a, a full suite. And then Google, and I'd say, you know, Snowflake, I'd say Microsoft has done it, Amazon. They, they became probably over the last two years, very uh, well-versed in banking regulations, meaning they could, um, they could speak all these acronyms, you know, now and they could say they were certified, which when we spoke to our regulators, again, being a bank, we have a, a slightly different challenge than uh, non-financial companies. Uh, so we have to, we're regulated by the OCC, by the Fed, by, um, uh, by, uh, I don't know, I can't name them all. So, uh, you know, in Explorers, we were, you know, we were challenged by HIPAA. Uh, so being able to explain to your regulators that, hey, we're moving our data to a platform into a vendor that supports all these certifications makes them a whole lot more comfortable. And at the same time, Google did have concerns about, do people think Google would use your data? And so uh, Thomas Kieran, again, who used to work at Oracle, joined Google and uh, made this pledge that no, they would never use your data for any kind of marketing, advertising, or anything, your data was your data. And there was just another kind of confidence level that um, we were going down the right path. They do have a lot of data and storage architectures, you know, from just Google Cloud Storage, but they have different uh, table structures from Cloud SQL, Cloud Spanner. We really focused in on two uh, to replace Hadoop on Terada, which is Google Cloud Storage, which is object storage, and BigQuery, which is kind of tabular uh, columnar storage uh, for performance and indexing. So those are two storage architectures. Really, uh, the Cloud Storage would replace a lot of the HDFS, and the uh, BigQuery would replace Teradata and Hadoop. Although we're finding we'll probably put a lot of the uh, Hadoop data right into BigQuery. Uh, just so people can access it, uh, even at that raw data lakes um, perspective. You know, the benefits of Google BigQuery, if you haven't seen it, it's scalable, it's simple, it's shareable, it's secure, uh, and you'll save money. We did a total cost of ownership model. Uh, because Teradata and your high-end proprietary machines are very expensive, it's pretty easy to build a business case to say Google BigQuery will be cheaper than Teradata. It's about a wash when you look at Hadoop because you're buying commodity hardware and cheap storage. So you're not gonna get a lot of storage savings. But when you say you're gonna have a single platform to manage, our other issue with our Hadoop installation was to get SQL access to Hadoop, we had to use IBM's Big SQL product. Or, uh, and so then you're dealing with IBM for Big SQL, you're dealing with Hortonworks Cloudera for the Hadoop uh, platform, and you're dealing with Teradata. So we're gonna get rid of three vendors, really. We're gonna get rid of Teradata, IBM, and Hortonworks Cloudera and go to Google to cover all of that. It actually simplifies. And most of our pain was actually in the big SQL Hadoop architecture where we were getting a lot of performance and uh, production run issues. Uh, I found this, if you're ever interested, there's a site out there called thecloudgirl.dev. Uh, she does lots of diagrams around Google products. Uh, 
this was a pretty uh, straightforward one saying, hey, if you were Greenfield and you wanted to use Google products, you could go from capture to process, to store, to analyze using all Google products. Again, this is where we felt Google had an advantage over Snowflake because you could go kind of horizontal left and right around the product, the Google BigQuery product to um, provide products. We didn't use all these products uh, because we had some investments in products already, and I'm sure most people do. So if you look at our capture, organize, consume analytics, very similar to that. Uh, we use Ab Initio for a lot of our tools. Now, if you're not in banking, you probably haven't heard of Ab Initio, but a lot of large banks bought it. It's a scale out ETL tool. Works for us. We have thousands of jobs on it. So we're not that interested in porting Ab Initio right now. Our bigger goal was to get off Hadoop and Big SQL, the IBM product, and get to Google data, uh, BigQuery. So uh, our target is to move all of this over to Google. Again, I said the, uh, the marts are there, all the analytics. Uh, workspaces are there, the Spark clusters, the uh, people using Python are out there. Uh, and now we're in the process of moving that, that data lake out to Google. Takeaways, things to remember if you were to do this or if you're doing it, I uh, just put a couple of security. Uh, we were, and Doug Knopf's on the call from my team, we were pretty early in terms of in, in our corporation of moving stuff to Google. So we had to spend a lot of time with our security team to set up the security architecture, the VPC environment, um, the data masking protocols. Google will encrypt everything at rest for you. So all data at rest is encrypted automatically, but our identity access management of how we're gonna provision people to Google, uh, we had to come up with, uh, and then you know explain all this to our regulators and our internal risk teams of how we were securing this. We believe, and I wouldn't say this in a public forum other than this one, you know, that it, we will say this, if done right, your security, uh, your data security at Google is probably gonna be more secure than uh, how you set up your security on-premise. You know, so not all of our data on premise was encrypted at rest uh, naturally, uh, but Google has multiple layers there. And we're doing a lot more tokenization and data masking as we move the data out to Google uh, than, we, than maybe we had done on premise. So uh, that's one thing I think you got to focus on. And depending on if your company's already set all this up, then moving your data is going to be a little quicker. If you haven't, you got a lot more work to set up your security protocols and environment. The second is training. Uh, we, we, you know, Doug's team actually built about 10 courses. Uh, to migrate the users. So uh, again, if your users are pointing to Teradata or Hadoop, there are some SQL differences. There's some uh, slight table changes. So we had to put together a set of classes to help people figure out how do I get to, to Google? How do my queries change? Um, how do the tables change and, and, and train them? Because it's not just getting the data, but it's getting all the users over there too. And we have about, just to give you context, probably 400 SaaS users that we had to get over there. Uh, Python users, uh, Tableau users, quite a few Tableau users, thousands probably to teach them just the slight variations of how to connect to Google, how to store the data at Google, how to access data at Google. The other one is, and this is, you know, for most people who are used to kind of on-premise fixed uh, depreciation model. So I'd say most large corporations buy hardware and then depreciate over three or five years, buy software and then pay maintenance. It's a fixed price model for, I mean, it's a fixed kind of expense model for most finance teams. But if you're gonna go to a variable cost model, and this is what I you know our chart of our Google uh, analytics or our analytics users tracking their costs over time. You can see, you know, when we launched and, and got them into full mode at the beginning of uh, last year, you can see take off in terms of compute costs. And so it's, we had to spend a lot of time in finance to say, how do you project and, and forecast a, a, a variable forecast going forward, right? Because finance people like a fixed forecast when they're forecasting. And now you're saying, we don't exactly know what's going to happen because we don't know what all the analytics teams are doing. There's ways in Google and Snowflake you can cap that. Um, we haven't done it yet. So you can let it fly wide open and every query you execute will get run or you can cap it and give it a constraint and therefore queries will start queuing up. But we're gonna track this over time and decide if we ever need to cap it. Users like it because there is no capacity. Like if you submit a job, it's gonna run uh, and Google will charge you for it because uh, they do have that scale out compute. And when the other thing we did is we can actually track in a much gra higher granularity than we could with some of our on-premise. So we track, um, you can see the compute engine here is the most expensive uh, chart here. So this blue bar is how much people are spending on compute. BigQuery is below it and kind of the orange. Storage is even below that. So the storage costs you almost nothing. The BigQuery is like about a nickel a query or chart anywhere between a nickel and 10 cents a query. Uh, but the compute, if you're standing, spinning up Spark clusters in Python, that's where you're going to spend more money. So we're tracking you know, how people are using the Spark clusters and the compute engines, because that's where your costs are really coming from. And then we have, we're tracking users you know, in a couple of different ways. We have marts that we create that we would call enterprise marts. And then there's this analytic workspace. There's about 50 of these. So every kind of business 
department has their own workspace. And that was true in Teradata. It's also true in Google. And they can kind of use their own ETL tools. They can store data. They can run their own models there. They can run their, um, you know, all the machine learning data sets there. Now, you know, there's new terms. And I know Chris from Progressive's on, you know, being called around data mesh and data fabric. Uh, I'm not sold on the concept of data mesh. I think Chris knows that. Uh, I'm going to do another talk maybe with Chris and Progressive on data mesh or data mess. Uh, but once you federate, I mean, you don't really, you lose control over what they're doing. And we're seeing just a ton of commute, compute in that space. Uh, and you really have to govern that to make sure they're not duplicating all the data and their, their queries are efficient and they're not really costing you a lot of money. So we spend a lot more time now tracking what users are doing than maybe we did in the past because um, because a bad query in the past could choke the box and other users would get penalized. A bad query here doesn't affect anyone else other than cost, right? So if someone runs a really bad query, it's not gonna block users, it's not gonna queue up any, anyone, but it will charge key money. So we now have built dashboards to track users specifically, departments specifically, see who's spending the most money and then go in and inspect it and say, are they doing bad things or queries that need to be tuned or they're, you know, they're doing select stars on large tables. We do it for the analytic workspaces. We do it for the marts. And then we can compare and you can see in this one, the orange chart is the analytic workspace queries. The blue ones are kind of the enterprise marts. And you see a, a rapid growth of the analytic workspaces, which is good in a way. It means the users are in there, they're doing work and there's, they're doing a lot more um, queries in their own workspaces, but it's, it's one we're tracking. So that's a big difference. And the other one I'd say, I didn't put it in here, is you know when you eliminate the bottleneck of, let's say, a Hadoop environment and Teradata where you have fixed capacity and you have now have unlimited capacity in Google, you really just move the bottleneck somewhere else. So the, the one I've been pushing the vendors on is in the BI tool space. You know The BI tools haven't really matured to a kind of consumption model pricing. You're still in a fixed user cost or a fixed core license cost. So what we found right away was that the SaaS grid that we had now became the bottleneck or the Tableau environment became the bottleneck because you no, no longer were constrained by Teradata or Hadoop. Uh, you were constrained by the next layer that had capacity models, right? And eventually I think those, all the BI tools will go to kind of a consumption model too with a variable compute model, but none of them are there yet because it affects their current licensing costs. And Mike, so you have about 30 seconds left. And that's it. There you go. So that's our journey. Uh, we'll be off Hadoop uh, and our Doug's on the call. I don't want to, I don't want to give him a mistake, but hopefully uh, in the next year, we'll be 18 months completely off Hadoop and uh, all our data will be up in uh, Google. But so far, so good. Google's uh, been a good experience for us. That is a fantastic presentation, man. There's a lot of information in there. Thank you very much, Mike. No problem. Um, that was, yeah, that was a great history and a great overview. Every, that's a right at time. Everybody give Mike a round of applause, physical or virtual, whatever you could offer up. Um, that is that's fantastic. Uh, Mike, good luck. I know you got to go to the Cavs game. Good luck. Uh, drive yep. safe. Thank you. And go Lucas. <laughs> cool. Uh, next up is Lucas Moore, who's going to do a talk on observability at scale. Uh, Lucas, uh, whenever you're ready. Cool. Thanks, Doug. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm Lucas Moore. I'm on the Cloud Observability SRE team at Elastic, and I'm going to talk to you a bit today about observability at scale. I wanted to mention, too, this is an updated and uh, otherwise modified version of the talk given by my team at Elasticon about a year and a half ago. So if you attended Elasticon 2020 and some of this sounds familiar, that's why. But uh, quite a bit has also changed since then. So as SREs, we spend a lot of time working on production incidents, investigating performance issues, digging through metrics and logs. Uh, looking for trends and lots of other data-driven types of activities. And of course, as a company that makes products specifically for that purpose, uh, we're really big into dog food. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about how we use the Elastic Observability products to help with the day-to-day -day observability and running of the Elastic Cloud platform. So uh, first I'll give you an idea of the scale of Elastic Cloud, both in terms of the customer infrastructure and also uh, the observability team's infrastructure. Uh, we'll talk about our ingest data ingest architecture. How do we get that data in? Uh, how do we manage configurations and resources for all of our observability clusters? Um, how are we using APM? And then also, what are we doing with the data we're collecting, specifically dashboarding? So Elastic Cloud, just to give an idea of kind of the scale of it, Elastic Cloud is our SaaS offering where you can easily spin up hosted deployments uh, that run Elasticsearch, Kibana, and the whole suite of Elasticsearch products. It's pretty large. It's growing larger every day. 
Um, if you go to cloud.elastic.co, you log in, you click create a deployment, you select from a cloud provider, uh, you then the specific region uh, within that cloud provider you want to deploy into. Um, our service is right now available in 56 regions globally, uh, including GovCloud in the US and four providers, GCP, AWS, Azure, and IBM. We're running over 100,000 customer deployments, uh, ranging from small single node, single zone uh, cluster uh, deployments, I guess you wouldn't call those clusters, uh, to some extremely large ones with hundreds of nodes spread across you know, uh, three availability zones. And in terms of virtual machines, we're running about 12,000 and over a quarter million containers. So that's Elastic Cloud as a whole on the observability team and our internal infrastructure, we're kind of doing dog fooding on steroids. Not only do we use the Elastic products for observability purposes in cloud, we also host those products within the cloud platform as well, just like regular customers would. So it gives us a really good insight into the kind of experience you know, our customers are having because we effectively are some of the largest customers of Elastic Cloud. Um, we're ingesting over 100 terabytes of data per day. Uh, that includes logs and metrics from all of our regions, uh, including our own platform logs and metrics, as well as logs and metrics from customers' deployments. Um, we are, uh, that data is flowing into more than 170 Elasticsearch clusters. And you might ask, why do you have so many observability clusters? Uh, one reason is to keep uh, clusters in the region that the data is flowing in from. Um, in terms of, you know, that in addition to being efficient in terms of data transfer, that also helps kind of limit the, the blast radius of changes. Um, and, you know, so like when we do things like upgrade a cluster, which we do a lot, uh, we can start with small canary regions, let things bake for a few hours or a day before we upgrade all of production. Um, another reason is our regions are vastly different sizes. Um, so this allows us to scale the clusters in those regions independently. And we've got over 2,500 nodes in those uh, 170 clusters, which includes our master data and uh, machine learning. So what's our ingest architecture look like? This is a, a high level overview of that architecture uh, for a single region. So we, we duplicate this in every region. We've got shipping from various sources through Beats, um, processing in the Logstash consumer tier in the middle, and then data delivery to the storage tier on the right, which are Elasticsearch clusters. Um, in the next you know, couple of slides, I'll take you through each of those tiers in, in more detail. So on the, on the data shipping side, every single one of our hosts runs what's known as a Beats runner container. Uh, that's a, running a custom built Docker image that runs file beat for logs and, and metric beat for metric data. Uh, and both of those are configured to output their data to the Logstash consumer fleet within that same region. We're using Docker auto discovery and file beat and metric beat. So we have a single file beat and metric beat config that gets deployed to all hosts. And then depending on what containers are running on that host, different parts of that config are activated. Um, so for example, proxy logs are only attempted to be ingested from an instance that are actually running a cloud proxy container. Um, it keeps it really simple for us in terms of configuration management. Um, on the metric beat side, we're using a bunch of different metric beat modules that are that are built in. Uh, system module for host metrics, Docker module, it gets a bunch of container specific metrics. Um, Prometheus module to get stuff from services that expose metrics in Prometheus format. And uh, several application models to ingest metrics from third party software that we use like HNProxy or ZP. Right now, we're using that beach runner container, as I mentioned, to manage the file beat and metric beat on those instances. Uh, we're looking forward to replacing that beach runner container with Elastic Agent at some point, which still runs beats under the hood, but it makes the, the deployment and configuration and process for that simpler. So why do we use Logstash as a consumer here when we could ingest data directly from beats to Elasticsearch? Um, Historically, we did it because the logs were mostly unstructured and we had to do a lot of rocking and parsing to dissect and format messages before inserting them into the Elasticsearch clusters. Um, today, that's not the case. Most of our services output structured JSON logs, so that's less of a concern. But we get some other benefits um, from Logstash, uh, you know, routing. So um, a single file beat process ships a mix of logs from a host. Some of those logs go to different Elasticsearch clusters, but file beat only supports a single output. So Logstash currently also ensures that we, it has it supports multiple outputs to make sure that we can route documents to the right uh, Elasticsearch cluster. It also does deduplication. Uh, Beats guarantees at least once delivery. So if an output is blocked, um, an event might've been received but not acknowledged and Beats will resend it. And you could end up with more than one copy of that document. Um, it's important to us that that not happen because some of these things are used for stuff like billing. We need to ensure there are no duplicates. So we use fingerprinting and Logstash to set unique document IDs based on characteristics within that document, ensure that we're only ingesting each document once. 
It also gives us some other nice side benefits like decoupling the, the data producers and the clusters so that we can do maintenance on a cluster and not worry about um, you know, hosts on the edge running out of disk space because they've got unprocessed log data or they rotate data off and lose it. Um, we're using Logstash uh, disk-based queues, which gives, gives us some buffer for those kinds of maintenance activities. And then it also gives us a single place to monitor the health and status of our data ingestion in a given region. So in every region, I mentioned we, we duplicate our infrastructure. It's identical on a region by region basis. In each region, we've got three clusters, one for logs, one for metrics, one for monitoring. Um, you know, some of the benefits of splitting it this way, similar to why we have uh, duplicate things region by region, it gives us an even smaller blast radius. So a problem affecting the logs cluster doesn't affect our ability to ingest and look at metrics and vice versa. It lets us scale things independently. Um, our metrics clusters are much more predictable in terms of data. Uh, because you know the number of deployments that are emitting metrics in a region uh, don't change terribly uh, rapidly on a day-over-day on -day basis, whereas log the amount of logs that are being generated are more uh, user dependent, and so that can vary pretty wildly. So it's good to keep them separate so we can adjust their scale profile separately. Um, you know, logs clusters are normally a little bit larger than the metrics clusters in in our busier regions. Both of our logs and metrics clusters are configured to ship their monitoring data to a separate in-region monitor cluster. Uh, so that lets us look at metrics for, for the other two. That's kind of how we watch the watchers. So how do we know that those other clusters and their associated Kaban instances in the log stash consumers are all behaving? So we've got a pretty small monitor cluster in every region to kind of keep in contact with those. Um, and then every logs cluster is configured with cross-cluster search to the metrics counterpart so that when you go into a region, uh, you can still just go to one cluster and do all of your searching uh, from that one cluster, even though the data might be on, on others. Um, and then last, with the, with the volume of data that we have, it doesn't make sense for performance or, or for cost reasons to keep it all in our hot tier. So we're leveraging frozen tier with searchable snapshots to be able to use Elasticsearch to directly query data from snapshots stored in cheaper object storage. So there, of course, there's a performance trade-off for that. But for us, in our use case, it's totally usable, even, even at our scale. And we can use ILM policies to kind of dynamically roll data over uh, to different tiers, depending on thresholds that we specify, like how many days it happens. So how do we manage these resources across all of these clusters? Um, you know, as I said, we've got over 170 clusters and counting. Um, and as you might expect, we, we need to keep configurations such as dashboards, watches, users, roles, index templates, all the resources you'd manage in an Elasticsearch or Kibana deployment, we need to keep those consistent. So we wrote our own internal tooling to help with that. Um, every logging cluster should be configured mostly the same, right? actually exactly the same, regardless of region, same for metrics and, and monitor clusters. So here's an example of the process of creating and distributing a new dashboard um, at a high level. A user would use a reference Kibana and Elasticsearch cluster to create a new dashboard. They can kind of prototype there, um, use the UI to create their dashboard. Uh, then they can use uh, our tooling to pull the, uh, the definition of that dashboard in JSON format from that reference cluster onto their local file system. They can create a, a pull request that contains that JSON representation of the dashboard. And then uh, they can submit that PR, have it reviewed, have it merged into our cluster management code base. And then an automated job runs where they can run it ad hoc to push assets from that uh, Git repo to all of our uh, all of the clusters of that type. So um, we don't do any manual configuration across any of those deployments. In the future, we'll be replacing as much of that internal tooling as possible with um, elastic packages, because that can deploy things like dashboards and watches. Uh, it's, a, it's an elastic product. We're also looking forward to contributing to an elastic stack Terraform provider to replace some of that custom tooling um, for things that can't be man managed in packages so that others can kind of benefit from some of that work. Lucas, I'm, I'm laughing at the job title on the lower left for the elastician. Yes, <laughs> for e yes, elasticians. Um, something else, Doug, I think this will resonate with you. Uh, we do frequent upgrades. We upgrade all of our, all of those 170 plus clusters as often as we can. So QA and staging environments upgrade to the latest minor version uh, daily. Uh, we've automated jobs to just upgrade them every day. And then production deployments, we still gate that, make that, um, uh, it's not totally automated, but uh, our goal is to, our OKR is to do those within three weeks of GA of a given Elasticsearch version. Um, typically, if QA and staging have been upgraded uh, seamlessly. We just do production you know, within a week. So we've got all of those clusters always running uh, the latest minor version of Elasticsearch and Kibana. 
um, which is great. It makes the uh, upgrades boring. And uh, shout out for Doug's ACM blog post. If you haven't read it, uh, check it out. So one of the pain points with having your data spread across so many deployments is knowing where to search for it. Historically, we had docs that contained IDs and URLs for all of the clusters and, and Kibana instances, and we still have that. Uh, but now if you wanna search for something, you can go directly to a centralized cluster that's configured to search across all of the other clusters uh, with cross-cluster search. It's pretty amazing, it works really well. Um, we can do queries across many billions of records in, in reasonable amounts of time. Just think seconds or tens of seconds, not minutes. Um, you know, and that solves a, a few problems for us. One, you, you don't have to know where to look. You don't have to spend time in the middle of an incident trying to figure out which region has the info you're looking for and then find the URLs um, for that region. Here's a screenshot, and it's probably hard to read, uh, but of our overview cluster, looking at the last one day of logs from one of the indexes, it's about 50 billion records. And I think this loaded in less than 10 seconds. And then the other problem it solves for us is global dashboarding. So we can have dashboards like this SLO one that consolidate data from all of the clusters in all of the regions and give us a holistic view of our SLOs across all of Elastic Cloud. So you know, with cross-cluster search, we kind of get to have our, our cake and eat it too. We have a lot of clusters located across all of the regions and we get kind of those efficiency and scale benefits that come with that, but uh, still the ease of use of a single cluster. Uh, so APM, you know, we've got pretty general like log and metric data flowing in and that's great, but we want to do APM too. Um, we've got a mix of Python, Go and Scala code uh, products written in those languages as part of the Elastic Cloud platform that are all instrumented in shipping data into um, the metrics cluster in every region. Um, that even just the out of the box JVM metrics for the Scala code in particular have helped us identify quite a few performance related bugs and we've been able to make significant improvements to the services based on that. One of the uh, really cool things we do with APM is in the dev environments. So in, in Elastic Cloud, developers can dynamically create sort of this Elastic Cloud in a box uh, environment that runs all of the cloud platform components, but in an isolated cloud environment uh, in, you know, specific to that developer. Um, since all of the components have APM integration, we bootstrap the dev environments so that from the moment they're created, um, they're shipping APM metrics to a shared APM dev cluster as well. So as developers are working, in their dedicated environment, they can go to this Kibana instance and inspect APM data from the products that they're working on. It gives them really good visibility into you know, the work they're doing, both for troubleshooting and for performance analysis. So it's great. We've got all of this data that we can ingest and aggregate, but what is it actually you know, good for? Um, well, for one, we do quite a bit of dashboarding. Um, so like this quote, monitoring tells you whether a system is working. Observability lets you ask why it isn't working. Dashboards are like the most basic and visible artifacts of observability, and they're a great tool for showing ad hoc views of data quickly. Uh, they're built on top of visualizations, and um, good dashboards are meant to describe a situation from a certain angle or tell a story. I think a lot of monitoring solutions come with TN dashboards out of the box. I think all of them do, uh, including ours, and, and those are great. You're probably all used to seeing ones for a server or network device and all the performance characteristics of that device. Um, where dashboards can get really powerful is when they're created to tell a story or give you a broader view of a problem. I'm gonna walk you through uh, one of ours here in a moment. Actually, I'll do it now. So um, earlier today, I got an alert that we had an ingestion delay for uh, a logging cluster in one of our reasons, uh, regions. And it's important for us to respond to these quickly because uh, too significant of a delay can impact things like billing some of our data is also directly visible to the end users. So the alert contains a link to this dashboard, like every good alert should. And I can see that starting over here at 15, this may be a little hard to see, but starting at uh, 1530, um, data started queuing, peaking at around 3 million backlogged events. So that's perfectly good monitoring information, but I need to understand why that's happening. And it'd be great if I could do it without having to go visit a bunch of different regions. So We'll take a look down. Here's our log stash events in and log stash events out per node. I don't really see any spikes, so I don't think our data volume um, has changed. Here's our indexing time per index and per node. So this is starting to look interesting. The indexing time for one of our indexes started to increase uh, right around uh, that same time. And over here, it gets even more interesting. I can see the indexing time for one node in particular within the Elasticsearch cluster started to spike at that time. And here I can see CPU utilization for one of the old nodes in the Elasticsearch cluster started to spike um, at that exact same time. 
And if I compare over here, the overall CPU utilization for Elasticsearch from today uh, versus yesterday, um, I can see that it's higher today, also starting at that same time. Um, I really like these visualizations too that show something like day over day in the same view. Uh, it helps establish a baseline. A lot of times when you're in the middle of an incident, it's hard to know what's normal and what's not. And uh, these types of visualizations really help with that. So here I can see um, more evidence that the problem is Elasticsearch and not Logstash because Logstash looks, looks fine. I don't see any spikes or anything to indicate problems at that time. No memory issues with Logstash. Um, no appreciable differences at that time in our indexing rate for index or fields count. Uh, but here I can see, oh, right here, we got a bunch of bulk tasks that are running, bulk inserts spiking at the same time. And over here on the right, I can see that which nodes uh, those are spiking for. Um, and at the end, I can see that, the, hey, there, here's one node in our Elasticsearch cluster that's queuing a bunch of writes. Um, so a lot of detail here, but this simple dashboard in five seconds of scanning through it, once I got that alert, took me from, hey, we've got an issue where data is queuing to one of the nodes in your Elasticsearch cluster is experiencing heavy CPU utilization and is the bottleneck or the culprit. And then from there, I was able to connect the last couple dots uh, to the root cause as a hotspot with some co-located shards on that node. And actually what would be great is to continue to build out this dashboard to even connect kind of those last few dots. And then here, I, you know, different roles inside the organization need different types of dashboards. So we have other users of our observability platform internally uh, that are using it for very different purposes. You know, analysts might be more interested in how many users are subscribing to a new service per day or per hour, rather than, you know, what are the system metrics that you're gathering. And last, we'll talk about alerting. So alerting is the other major, I guess, consumer in, in a sense of our observability data. Um, dashboards are consumed by humans. Alerts are consumed by humans and by other systems. We heavily utilize Elasticsearch Watcher uh, to periodically uh, execute queries and then evaluate the responses and act upon them. Really anything you can do in an Elasticsearch query um, plus the manipulation with the painless scripting language you can do in a watch. And then the actions in include things like sending notifications to Slack, or pager duty, uh, executing webhooks against systems like Rundeck to trigger automatic remediation actions, which we do, um, or even re-ingesting the results of that watch into some other cluster so you can continue to do future analysis. Uh, we've got a bunch of different alerts configured in the logging in the metrics clusters. Here's a, some examples of a few different types. Um, one thing that we uh, are very strict about, all of your notifications, all of your alerts have to have a runbook attached. Um, so that when they page somebody, there's a link that here's the runbook for how do you deal with that? How do you deal with this alert? And then ideally they'd have dashboards associated. Uh, eventually right now we're using Elasticsearch Watcher. We also are planning to start to use Kibana Alert soon. It's a newer Kibana component um, that's a little more user-friendly than Watcher. Uh, it gives you some easier testing of alerts, a dashboard to monitor alert status, better functionality around things like deduping alerts or snoozing them while you investigate. Um, And that's it. Well, you got about uh, 30, uh, 35 seconds. Uh, any quick questions uh, for folks on the line? That was some great stuff. Uh, and the, uh, I mean, just the, the narrative on, um, on like, hey, the cluster's got an issue, the timing, that was, super, that was really cool. That was cool. really cool. Um, anybody, anybody, any last minute questions here? Going once, going twice. Cool, I'm seeing some claps there. Uh, oh, cool, let's uh, give uh, let's give Lucas a, a round of applause here, physical and virtual. Um, that was that was a fantastic presentation. Um, and uh, yeah, again, I'd like to thank all our speakers. Uh, Mike had to drop Mona, Lucas, and Mike. And again, thanks for uh, John. Murdoch from the Linux Foundation. Again, we couldn't do it without you. Um, so thanks everybody for coming. And the next meetup is going to be in uh, in March. And uh, I think I've got a a placeholder um, placeholder uh, already on the meetup for that. So again, everybody, drive safe if you're going anywhere. If not, just have a cup of hot cocoa and relax. <laughs> so and have a good night. Uh, thanks everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. Yeah.